and my notes are gone. <laughs> Where are they? <laughs> Welcome. Same place to... as mine. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We're off for a good start. <laughs> Moot Talks, a podcast by Moot Markerai, with your host Ira Molai. Welcome to today's edition of uh, Mood Talks. Uh, today's guest, uh, who I'm very happy to uh, talk to, uh, is a biologist by training, a graduate, a biology graduate. Uh, she used to be active in uh, the sales of scientific equipment, uh, is now very busy as an amateur astronomer, presenter and writer, and uh, is a bass player as well. But I must honestly say, uh, I don't really know where to start because what I've just told you is just a tiny glimpse of uh, what uh, my guest does and uh, doesn't really describe her well. Uh, every topic that you touch is like a rabbit hole that you dive into because there's so much more to follow and so, uh, so much more that she does. Um, so uh, without further ado, let me uh, very, very warmly welcome Mary McIntyre. Hello, Mary. Hi. It's so great to have you on today. Thank since, you for having me. Uh, it's it's a, a pleasure. So since it's so difficult where to start because there is so much, maybe we should, uh, you know, just uh, touch on the topic of how and where we met and what, uh, you know, like the first thing that connects us. Um, I don't know. Maybe I give the floor to you and you just uh, talk about that a little. Um, yeah, well, we met because of Iridium satellite flares, uh, sadly have gone now, but um, it was just such a great thing to be in. Sorry, my cat. <laughs> um, yeah, also lover of cats. Um, yeah, we met through Iridium flare photography and sharing photographs of Iridium flares and a project that was put together um, to try and catch photographs of all of the satellite that flared before the um, the whole network was deorbited and that kind of brought together a real niche community within the astronomy world and you was one of those people and yeah it was uh, really nice to connect with people that had a love of those things because I know they were a bit of a you know love-hate thing but not many people kind of kept spreadsheets and records of all the Iridium flares that they caught, captured and that was one thing we all did which I thought was a great connection. Yes, I guess it immediately sort of got us close because uh, we share the same uh, passion for that, which uh, it's a sad thing because it's uh, it's over now. No? Um, so I know. we have to rely on our records and uh, all the beautiful pictures that we've taken. Uh, so I guess this brings me to, uh, to like the first point. Um, when we talk about iridium flares, it has to do with the night sky. So what I mainly do there is look up and think, well, this is wonderful and marvelous, and uh, take out my smartphone uh, to to take some pictures, and that's just about it. Yeah. Uh, but with you, it's a whole different order of magnitude. So uh, you actually uh, you say you're an amateur astronomer, but you have got yourself some training, if I understand that correctly. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I've loved the night sky since I was a child. My mum loved the moon because she remembers seeing the moon landings when she was a child. And I kind of got my passion of the night sky from her. And before I could even read properly, I was looking at star maps and the, the mythology of stars, the ladybird books about the constellations and the Greek myths. And that really captured me. But as an adult, once you start working, it's quite a difficult hobby to maintain practically because you can't stay up till five in the morning if you've got to get up for work the next day so it sort of took a back burner it was always an interest and then I moved to London when I was 18 and you can't see an awful lot from London it, there's a mm. lot of light pollution so I remember seeing Comet Hale Bop and I kind of always wanted another telescope I had one when I was 11 it was a bit rubbish didn't really know what to do with it didn't really have a mentor but that interest was always there but when I became disabled and couldn't work anymore I had the opportunity of doing the astronomy GCSE and that just really reignited it I mean I was already using my telescope again but that got me into trying astrophotography and it just went on from there. Once I started to learn, I thought I knew a lot about astronomy till I studied the GCSE and realized I knew nothing. 
and I wanted to know more. So I went on and studied with the Open University and did the certificate in astronomy and planetary science, which again was next level of information. Um, but while all that was happening, I was carrying on with the astrophotography, getting better at that, getting better equipment. Through astronomy, I met my husband and he built us an observatory. And so we kind of took everything to the next level there. And then off the back of that, I now do a lot of astronomy talks and astrophotography workshops. And I do talks from age two to 100. Um, so I'm kind of covering lots of different topics all to do with astronomy, lots of different places around the country. And so, yeah, it's, it's been amazing. Actually, sometimes I'm so busy writing talks and I write some articles for Sky at Night that I don't actually have time to do any practical astronomy. <laughs> so it's, I've got so busy with astronomy, I can't do astronomy sometimes, which is a bit frustrating. But, you know, equally, I love getting a, a magazine article that might be something that's slightly outside of my comfort zone and makes me carry on learning which is you know what we're always doing in this hobby so I keep very busy kind of within the community and yeah. <laughs> well uh, so I'm not really uh, fearing that you will get out of practice soon because uh, I very often see your astronomy pictures on, on the, the social media so I guess you're well in practice <laughs> <laughs> yeah but not as many pictures as i'd like but i you know i've managed to fill up another hard drive in the last 12 months so i'm doing something <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and i guess uh, you you've also started uh, a couple of things uh, you know you you're very um motivated to uh, showcase what women do in in science and in astronomy as well is that right can you talk a little about that yeah definitely um a few years ago some friends of mine were running the knowledge observatory in the north of england and what they were doing there is taking children or, or teenagers from slightly deprived backgrounds or people that didn't have the best time at school and they were using astronomy as a vehicle for teaching core subjects and it was a really great thing that they were doing and they realized that there was a huge disparity professionally um, in senior roles of women in astronomy and certainly there was still a disparity back then as well within hobby astronomers there are certain women that don't feel comfortable going to a star party by themselves for example that they're just worried about being out in a field in the dark with a load of men which is crazy <laughs> and they set up the UK Women in Astronomy Network as a way of trying to bring positive female role models both amateur and professional to encourage amateur astronomers to keep going with their hobby but also to try and encourage young girls into a career in astronomy in space science and to show them that there's a whole world of careers out there within STEM subjects and I took over the running of that a few years ago and it's primarily social media based but if there's ever a story of something interesting that's been done by a female astronaut or a female speaker or anything whether they're an amateur or whether they're a professional we try and share those stories on there but we also showcase anyone that we've got a Flickr group for female astrophotographers so that other women can go and get inspiration from what those women are doing but we share stuff that's relevant to male and female we're not kind of an exclusively female social media there are male followers there as well who are interested in helping spread the word of what women do in the hobby and professionally but also there's information that's relevant, whether you're a male or a female, it's just about astronomy as well. So it's not one of these kind of, oh, no men allowed kind of platforms that we do have males as well. And they've been instrumental in helping get the word out, which, you know, I know a lot of men that are very passionate about promoting women and not just astronomy, but computer science and physics and that kind of thing as well. So it's been really nice to, to kind of be involved with that and just try and help people as much as possible and I do so much on a one-to-one -one with people I mean just this week there was um, a lady contacted me on Twitter her daughter's doing astronomy GCSE and had borrowed a camera didn't have a clue where to start so I've been exchanging messages and then yesterday I got a, a photograph sent that she'd taken with this camera which is amazing some lovely star trails and she you know she's done that because of help that I've given and I hope that encourages her to do the same so I really love that when I help people and they send me pictures that they've taken because 
they followed my advice or pointers then that makes it all worthwhile so yeah there's a, there's a lot of women out there doing really good work that don't promote themselves enough so it's good to have a platform to do that Mm -hmm. And I guess that's one of your many, many talents, you know, to uh, put into a nutshell what people are good at and uh, what they do and uh, just put it out there. So what, what's your experience when, you, when you're out there, you know, doing talks and all that? Um, so how interested are girls or women in, uh, in astronomy or science topics on the whole? Very, actually. At a younger age, the, the girls are as into it as the men are. There's just something happens when girls reach teenage years. I don't know whether they lose confidence in their abilities. I'm not really sure what it is, but I'm always astounded when I go and do a talk at an astronomy society and I find out I'm only the second female speaker they've had in a 50-year history. And it just astonishes me because I, I guess because of what I do, I've connected with a lot of females who are interested in astronomy. I don't know why these people aren't being booked also to do talks. I don't know why, whether they're just not confident enough to promote themselves to do it. I, I really don't know. I don't feel that I'm extra talented in any way. I just, I've been lucky enough that word of mouth has spread and I'm really busy with talks. But it makes me sad that you know if people are possibly using me as the poster female speaker hopefully the repeat bookings I get are not because of that they're because they enjoy my talks but I hope it makes people think that there are other women out there doing it because there are loads of women that do talks in astronomy and mm -hmm. space science and physics but people just don't know the names of them and I, I don't know. Girls are as interested as boys are at school. I don't know what happens between then and adulthood that's making them not pursue this more seriously. I, I wish I knew the answer to fix this because you know, there is still a big disparity at senior level with people, women working in STEM. And it's, it, it's the same in music. It's the same in computing, computer programming. There's a lot of women doing it at a younger age there's loads of girls go on workshops to learn but not that many computer programmers at a senior level mm -hmm. and I, I don't know why mm -hmm. I really don't understand why I mean over the years there's been a lot of overt sexism out there and there are certain people that still think that women aren't capable of doing this kind of mental stimulation which is quite shocking <laughs> 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 I, re I, I just I think women are so good at multitasking and they're so good at you quite often get men and this is a very a sweeping statement but men are very often good at one thing particularly mm -hmm. and they're they're okay at other things but a lot of women I know are brilliant at so many things and they seem to be multi-talented and still manage to do that while juggling motherhood and school runs and all of this type of thing and I just think that that needs to be celebrated more um, mm -hmm. because yeah, women are good at this stuff. If that's where their passion is, they're very good at this stuff. And there's no reason why they shouldn't be doing astronomy, physics, astronauts, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. So uh, any ideas what, uh, what kind of encouragement uh, would be most valuable to, to girls or teenagers uh, to, to pursue a career? I think just constantly, if you have a social media presence yourself, just sharing stories of other women that are doing it, mm -hmm. showing them that there are role models out there. I mean, very often, if you say to any just a general group of people, name a fe famous female astronomer, they could probably name Caroline Herschel, possibly a couple mm -hmm. of others. But I do a talk on women in astronomy and in an hour I can fill the time just people before Caroline Herschel. There isn't even time to talk about the people after her. So we need to get the word out more about the important role that women have played previously in history because there's a lot of women that did. You now women had to go through hoops to be able to get jobs in astronomy in the, the kind of 19th century. They had to be way overqualified compared to the men. They were paid far less. And then if they got married, they usually had to give up their work. And despite that, they were still doing it. You know, these were the women that just thought no we're going to break the mold here and just get out and do that and so on UK women in astronomy we have Brian Jones who's a, a astronomy historian and he's constantly sharing stories about women astronomers from all the way through 
history will share their birthdays or the anniversary of a crater being named after them, things like that. So that's really good to show that actually there was a lot going on before Caroline Herschel, as amazing as she was, and I would love to go back and meet her. Um, there, there's a lot of stuff that's gone on before that. And equally, there are a lot of people in the future that are the rising stars and I follow them on social media, follow their stories, the people that are getting out there and showing what they're doing because that will give confidence to younger generations to go and do the same. So I think just more of that. And if we see anybody being outwardly sexist, just stamp on it straight away because no. it's not, it's not okay to be like that in this day and age. <laughs> So uh, I guess by now our audience might have found out why I talked about the rabbit hole at the beginning. So uh, everything that you've said just now would be a, a topic in itself, you know, which we could talk about for maybe even more than an hour or so. Uh, but you've given me some you know, keywords already uh, about the, the many talents that so many women have. And uh, I just uh, sort of uh, have to, to pass this uh, back to you. Uh, and uh, move on to to one of your other uh, passions and uh, talents so you're also a bass player and uh, that's also something that unites us um, yes <laughs> I would always be far too um, sort of um, scared to call myself a bass player because my level of doing it is incredibly limited but I have a, a great passion for it so what do you do as a bass player and how did you get there and how does it fit together with everything else if it does um, I was born in 1973, so as a child, my early memories is disco music, um, which is cheesy and pretty terrible when you listen to it these days. But there's one thing that runs through disco music, and that is amazing bass lines. And those guys really knew how to funk some bass. And I was tuned into that before I even knew what bass was. I became a dancer when I was a teenager. I used to do lots of different styles of dance, like ballroom, Latin, and rock and roll, disco. And the disco is the stuff like earth, wind, and fire, dancing to that stuff. And you really locked into the bass, whether you know it or not. When you're dancing, that's what you're dancing to. So I've always had that kind of rhythm. But I never felt I had the coordination to be a drummer. I, I can't do things independently with four limbs. I just can't do it. Um, but when I was uh, oh, 16, I got with my first boyfriend who was a guitar player. And I knew I could never match up to what he could do on guitar. So it kind of fell in that I would buy a bass and learn. And to be honest, it's the only instrument I've really ever wanted to learn anyway. So I was probably about 21 when I bought my first bass, which I still have. I will always have a very sentimental attachment to it. It's, I guess, by today's standard, it'd be a bass-shaped object. It's not really gig-worthy, but I will always um, <laughs> love it. So I kind of played in my bedroom. I had lessons, but again, this confidence thing, I was too scared to join a band I didn't think I'd be good enough I was scared of making a mess my teacher said you need to join a band and I was just no not ever happening there's only three people had ever heard me play and that kind of took a, a back burner and about four years ago it will be I was having lessons again in the village I live in now and my bass teacher kept saying to me you need to join a band and I was like no I'm not joining a band and in my lesson I was learning Hotel California and I'd only just started playing it and he said to me oh, I, I, my friend next door's just learned this. I'll give him a call. And he brought him in and said, right, let's play it together. And I was like, oh, there's somebody else in the room. I can't do this. And he, met, he just threw it on me because he knew I would say no if he asked. And I, I kind of did it and thought, okay, I went wrong a couple of times. It wasn't too bad. And then after another lesson, when he did the same, the guitar player said, oh, actually, I'm in a band who's looking for a bass player. Come down and play with us. So I kind of was, OK, this was a, an audition without me even knowing I was being auditioned for the role as this bass player. So I kind of went down and it was in at the deep end. Whatever you think you know about music, you don't know anything until you join a band. And within six months, I understood why my teachers kept telling me you need to join the band. This band, um, he, it's uh, the first band I joined, is a guy who writes really beautiful folk inspired music it was all original material so I had to write my own bass lines for the first time ever I had to learn where the notes were on my fretboard for the first time ever I had to understand what I could play over a chord for the first time ever so it wasn't just suddenly learning a song anymore it was about understanding composition and 
and I just threw myself into it and absolutely loved it. The first time we played an open mic night, I was almost sick with nerves because I was so frightened of playing in public. And I guess it took a year of severe stage fright before I started to actually enjoy it. And at the same, around about a month after I joined that band, another band with the same guitar player asked me if I'd come and jam with them as well. So I ended up in two bands. I never do anything by halves. So I joined two bands and suddenly I was kind of doing open mic nights and gigging with two bands. And, and again, it took probably 18 months of regular gigging before I got over this abject terror of being on stage. What really broke the stage fright for me was my band was due to host an open mic night and the guitar player cut his finger really badly and he said, oh, I'm going to have to cancel. But it was near Christmas and I knew there were loads of people in the village were looking forward to it. Contacted another singer. Can you step in? No, I've got laryngitis. So I had 48 hours. I thought, right, I'm going to have to step up and do this. So I had to learn lead vocals to eight songs in 48 hours wow. and then get up and perform lead vocals and play bass at this open mic night. I didn't enjoy a second of it. I hated being on lead vocalist. I really hated it. But after that night, there is nothing now that scares me about performing because it was just, it, it was, I didn't have enough time to talk myself out of it. So I'm kind of glad I did it, but I never ever want to be a lead vocalist again. I just really didn't enjoy the experience. But since then, now when I get up and play bass, I, I just enjoy it and I'm not bothered if I go wrong. I just want to look like we're having a good time and a new band that I started playing with recently we play really upbeat songs that everyone knows and sings along to and so I've got a nice mixture now with stuff that's our own composition stuff that's covers and a real mixture with the three different bands that I've been involved with so yeah my bass skill has definitely improved massively since joining those bands and you know now learning a new song can take me two hours or it used to take me a month so mm. you just you pick things up a lot quicker and my technique has definitely improved um although I've got a long way to go I think but, <laughs> but I do really enjoy it and if I haven't been playing for a while I just kind of feel a bit like oh I need I need the music I think music's <laughs> very healing isn't it it can be a a good experience so absolutely absolutely i feel exactly the same you know i miss it when i don't do it for a long time and, and yeah. there are those it, it, it always happens late in the evening uh, where i think i have to play some bass now yeah <laughs> and of course i have to put the volume down and everything you know but then i just uh, put on some music that i like and uh, try to play along and it's i don't know afterwards i'm sure Oh, it feels so good huh? so it's, it's um... it is it's good and the stuff I listen to generally is not necessarily what I play with the bands yeah. but I like the fact that and I would never have contemplated learning a Bruno Mars song but actually there are a couple of Bruno Mars songs that are incredibly fun to play on bass and that would just not have even been on my radar and I'm getting to play pop punk I'm getting to play classic rock I'm getting to play some kind of dusty Springfield type stuff and it, it's just such a wide variety of music and it's really good to just get those different styles learned because you can't just be well you can just be a rock bassist but I, I like to branch out and learn different styles. So having the folk and the rock and punk and just all these different inspirations, it's just really good fun to learn the different techniques. And, you know, the YouTube's great as well. If there's a particular style you want to try and mimic, there are so many great YouTube tutorials out there, which, you know, lose me within about 30 seconds, but, you know, you kind of pick up the basics. <laughs> and there we go into another rabbit hole and we could talk about this for hours. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's another thing, uh, Mary, that I would like to address. Uh, I started off introducing you as a biologist and someone who uh, sold scientific equipment. So what happened to this science career? We have not talked about that yet. Has this been lost in the past? And if so, why? Yeah, well, what happened when I was working in a research lab um, in the 90s, I was only 21. I was doing my degree part time at the time. I injured my back moving compressed gas cylinders and I ended up having a lot of time off that year. And my back never really fully recovered from that. I, I always had a weakness there. When I was selling scientific equipment, I was loading heavy equipment into the car and I felt 
my back go again but that time I had to have surgery so I've now had five surgeries on my spine um, I spent a lot of years in a wheelchair um, so it kind of put an end to the driving and an end to my career um, as I just had to turn it into a positive and just thought right it's great this gives me more time for astronomy I had to have something to keep my brain going so I still have a lot of spinal problems I have a lot of pain issues I've got hardware in my spine that tells me when it's going to rain because my screws ache it's just crazy this kind of this internal barometer there so if I've been busy doing talks or I've had a night out in the cold doing astrophotography I know for a couple of days I'm going to be bedridden if I have a busy week doing a lot of talks, the chances are I'll be bedridden for several days afterwards. But I'm strongly of the mind that I'd rather have those big positive days and then take the consequences and actually enjoy doing the talks and getting that mental stimulation. So I know some people think I'm crazy, but I, <laughs> I always push too hard. And one of the side effects of unfortunately my condition is the pain causes me to have non-epileptic seizures. And it drives my husband mad because if I'm having seizures, it means I've done too much. And you, you know me well enough to know that that happens on an almost weekly basis. <laughs> <laughs> so I've kind of got a bit better in the last year of listening to my body more. And if, if it's too much, I just think, no, tonight I'm not going to go out imaging. I'm going to listen to my body and rest. But I, I have lo I really do a lot of craft activities as well. And even on the days where I'm in bed, I'm not sitting idle. I'm crocheting or knitting or painting or jewellery making or whatever it is I feel capable of doing on a tray in bed. That's what I'll do. So I, I never actually ever do nothing. I, I, I just can't. <laughs> I'm, now, I'm now so stubbornly determined to not let this condition beat me that no matter what stage of pain I'm in I will crochet lead flat on my back if necessary but I'll still be making something so <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I guess that's uh, that's an incredibly amazing thing uh, uh, so what uh, what uh, touches me so much about you and uh, what, what I admire so much about you is this incredible on, on the one hand this multi-talented uh, uh, facets of you and on the other hand this adaptability yeah? so how you deal with those challenges uh, and how you sort of uh, only bring them up in uh, I don't know a part of a sentence or if asked about it uh, as if this was a minor thing and uh, by what you've described about your condition uh, I get that at least there are days where it's not at all a minor thing, yeah, but for it as a really No, it's well when I first got into astronomy kind of within social media, everybody knew that I was the disabled lady that was into astronomy. And then about four years ago, I was given, um, and I, I have a spinal cord stimulator, so it's kind of wired up. There's electrodes near my spinal cord, and I've got a battery under the skin in the side, and it behaves a bit like a TENS machine. And I'd had one previously that didn't work. And I was offered the surgery of this ne next generation one that works at a different frequency. And I went in there with a completely open mind, not expecting anything. And they switched it on. And even before it was optimized, probably within eight hours, I started to walk around the ward without crutches. And I went in there in a wheelchair. I could only walk 30 meters at most. By the end of the eight day trial, I was walking the length of the ward with no crutches at all. So they were like, okay, that's a good sign. I got the surgery. And there are still days when I can't walk more than 10 meters, but for the most part with sticks, I can get around and do things now. And that, kind of gave me back a, a lease of life and I think I felt like it was a second chance I'd kind of got in a bit of a rut where I did a few craft things I had a passing interest in astronomy I'd done the study in but didn't really have that light in me and I kind of felt right this is a second chance this could go at any time my back could go again this could stop working and I'd be back to square one I'm going to make the most of every single day that I've got that's better and use every second of time that I have to the best of my ability and by having that mentality I probably give myself more down days than if I didn't <laughs> ironically 
but I just kind of now people know me as the astron amateur astronomer that does talks and it's only as a passing thing they think oh actually it says on her website that she might need wheelchair access sometimes and it's a surprise people just don't know that and, and I guess you know I've, I've had disability hate messages on social media I've, I've had prejudice I've had bad experiences and I've have had just outright abuse if I talk about my seizures or whatever from certain people so I tend to guard some of that now on my social media outlets because generally people don't want to hear about your bad day I, I if it's a really bad day I'll have a moan but in general I just put a positive spin on it because gen people aren't interested they don't want to hear about you having a crap day they don't want to hear about you're not being able to walk this time so I tend to not talk about it as much on social media and it's not because I'm ashamed of it or anything it's just because I can't cope with the abusive messages afterwards it's just so soul destroying when you do so much for the community and give your time freely for so many things and all people can do is say oh you're just looking for attention if you moan about oh, this no. thing <laughs> and so I just I don't have the energy so it's easier to just compartmentalize that and people who know me well can tell when I'm having a bad day they, they can tell without me saying they can tell reading between the lines of what I write on my statuses they know so that's really nice that there are people out there that look out for me but but in general you know I'm, I, I'm actually having a bad phase again at the moment where I'm losing mobility but it's not as bad as it was before the surgery so I'm just kind of pulling back a little bit from all the traveling and hoping that things settle again but if if that's it and I have to stop doing talks it's been an amazing four years and I'm glad that I did it so fingers crossed it won't come to that but you know I just that that gave me my second lease of life and you know I just I now I'm so motivated to just make the best of even if things do go horribly wrong and I end up kind of almost wheelchair bound again I'm never going to go back to the place I was before because there's too many things that have been re-sparked in my head and I'll, I'll just keep fighting and keep going <laughs> uh, I'm sure you will um, what I'd be interested in now is uh, obviously there was a time when you were in a very bad place so what what helped you to get out of it and uh, to to become or stay uh, optimistic and positive how, how did you do that what, what resources did you use um initially when things were really bad i found a chronic pain forum i actually found two chronic pain forums and it was really good connecting with other people that have gone through the same thing, particularly because I was at a relatively young age. And I've already noticed since my first injury, the way doctors treat me now I'm 47 is very different from how they did when I was 21. And now it's very much, oh, well, you're just getting older. They're, they're not as keen to help as they were then. So I've noticed a bit of a, a shift from the medical profession, but having other people that were younger that had gone through it, kind of sharing things that work that didn't work, I've tried every fad diet, I've tried every exercise regime, graded exercise regime. I suffer with fibromyalgia as well as all the other medical things. And one of the things you get with that is chronic fatigue. And when you have chronic fatigue, graded exercise just does not work. They, they constantly tell you it does, but every time I've tried it and stuck with it, I've ended up in A&E. It's just not worth it. So I have um, stretches that I do regularly that help the pain. I kind of do a certain amount of core stability stuff, adapted Pilates, and I do that regularly. I can't, I do try and walk a little bit. Certainly I'm active around the house, even if I don't go out walking. So I kind of keep the activity levels like that. Otherwise it's been, mindfulness has been a really big help. And I think one of the, I was very, I didn't understand mindfulness at all when I did the first mindfulness course. We're kind of staring at this raisin for 20 minutes and I'm kind of thinking, <laughs> what on earth is going on here? But I stuck with it and I found it tedious doing the daily meditations and I was like, oh, this is just boring. But actually, after about four weeks of doing it, I started to look forward to the meditations and I don't always make time to do that every day, but I've found one of the things we got very good at was acceptance and by accepting what you've got and not constantly fighting it and try to change it, suddenly you've got energy left to actually live with it. 
and the pain hasn't got better the pain is still there but somehow mentally I just deal with it so much better so even though I'm not doing daily meditations I still the principles of mindfulness the the kind of self-care being the primary thing all of those sorts of skills have really taken me forward in a better way than anything I've ever done before I've gone through hours of cognitive behavioral therapy and you know all sorts of stuff and they've never really helped but mindfulness did and you know whenever anything's a buzzword it's the cure-all for everything at the moment and you know every coloring books have got mindfulness written on it and there's all sorts of stuff that just isn't actually mindfulness and if you just let the preconceptions go and for me I actually found that once I stuck with it and did let the preconceptions go it was a big turnaround point for me and making me realize that I can still do all these things even if I am disabled some days more than others and just accepting that yeah some days I have to just stay in bed that's fine Mm -hmm. just find something to do that keeps you active it's okay don't feel guilty about the fact that you're in bed for a day if you need to go and lie down for an hour that's okay because you can't pour from an empty vessel is the overriding thing that I took from mindfulness and I know I I still don't always look after myself when I push too hard and I am getting better at it than I was. And I think that that was the thing that did it for me. And I know that that won't work for everybody, but in the end I had to leave the pain forum because I was giving so much of myself to others that I had nothing left for me. And it was starting to make me feel very down. I was bringing everybody's problems home with me after I'd logged off the computer. I couldn't sleep. So I was worrying about this person. And so it was good when I started, started but then I had to kind of move away from that and step away slightly from surrounding myself with other people in pain I now have a small number of very good friends who have been through similar physical issues we message each other regularly check in how each other are doing I've met through mindfulness somebody else that has non-epileptic seizures it's the only person I know that suffers with it that's been great so having people that understand nearby is good but also just looking after yourself is the thing that's really helped so you know hopefully that will help other people if they're thinking about mindfulness because i i certainly found it a really big benefit i've done two mindfulness courses now and they were very similar in structure but i i gained a lot from both what i find very interesting uh, when when you talk about sort of your main strategies is this uh, combination that might sound contradictory you know uh, on the one hand saying you have to take good care of yourself and on the other hand saying well i try to get as much as possible out of yeah. time and not not waste a single moment um yeah uh, I guess it might sound contradictory, but uh, you know, being in a in a situation like this, uh, I, I guess uh, you know, brings you to a point where where it's um, within yourself. It, it it might be quite quite logical and quite um, sort of suit, suiting. I do push too hard still, and it drives my husband insane because you know he knows what's going to happen the following day or in the days to come. He knows I'm going to end up having seizures and fainting and whatever, and he can see that I'm getting tired and I'm not listening. And I, I'm still, I've just got to write this. I've just got to do that. I've just got to do this other thing. And he's like, "Go to bed." <laughs> <laughs> so he gets very frustrated with me. Um, and certainly in the previous few years, I, I can kind of got a little bit of extra energy and then just wiped myself out completely and spent a lot of time with facial injuries because of seizures and whatever I'm getting better the balance is definitely getting better and I have had to cut down how many talks I do I I love it so much I would do it every day given a chance but I just physically can't so I'm I'm learning to say no I'm learning to I mean I've had to start taking bookings into 2022 because I'm already getting so fully booked to, I mean, I've got loads of spare time in my diary, but I just can't say yes to things. So it is a bit frustrating, but you know, when I just, one thing that my husband always reminds me of is I quite often feel that I'm not doing a good job of all the things that I do or that I'm in some way a failure because I haven't done 10 talks instead of two. Um, But he just says, well, look at what you was doing five years ago compared to what you're doing now. And, 
just actually be proud of what you're actually achieving and I don't do that often enough and I think that's important so yeah I might have to say no to a lot of things but five years ago I was doing zero talks so mm -hmm. doing two a month even is good and if that's inspiring other female speakers to have a go then it's worth worth it so mm -hmm. so I, I am getting a bit better at the balance thing you know it's always <laughs> it just you know life is like that life isn't it you can't plan and pace everything there are things that come up short notice that you just have to say yes to or you know that there are always things that are going to happen and you just have to try and give yourself a bit of breathing space and I find that even if I just go upstairs and lie down on the memory phone for just five minutes in my day it will give me a bit of a relief from the pain and I can keep going again mm -hmm. and it's taking that five minutes where you think you don't have time but actually five minutes lie down do a short meditation and you come out of it feeling refreshed and mm -hmm. raring to go again so I think it's having the confidence to say yes I do have time to have a break here and just give yourself the space that you need if you need it so yeah I am I hopefully will find the right balance at some point but <laughs> I know the stubbornness is always there going don't let this beat you but well I can I can relate so much to to this uh, thing of finding a better balance you know and uh, I've only learned it um, I guess over the last year uh, to, to do this because uh, I, I also had a, a spine surgery uh, nothing as uh, you know, serious as you have, uh, but still, uh, I, I have better days and worse days, and I had uh, bad periods uh, where I was quite worried about uh, how things would progress. And uh, about a year ago, I started to, to take breaks, uh, to take real breaks, and to allow myself to, to lie down in between and to have a rest, be it five minutes or an hour or so. And I'm so much better now. Yeah, and it's so amazing much. what five minutes can do it makes a big difference it actually does and and you know finding ways of how still to make use of this time so i do a lot of work now simply lying down you know sometimes on my carpet sometimes on my bed i do a lot of social media research and uh, uh you know work for Mutmacherei, and it it's it's perfectly all right and on the whole i'm so much better yeah so i, I could do with one of those kind of contraptions that hold something above your head so when you're lying flat you can read a computer screen or a tablet because <laughs> I, I normally hold my phone up like this and i keep dropping it onto my face and <laughs> <laughs> this has happened to me <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So um, uh, there's, there's one point that you've mentioned already uh, that you sort of found an activity, a different kind of activity of crafting activity for sort of every posture that you take. Um, and it's also something that you've mentioned as a side note, but I guess it's another kind of rabbit hole. So let's talk a bit more <laughs> about, you know, the, the uh, arts that you do and, and, and the crafts that you I guess very good at and what you've made uh, of it can you can you talk about that a little yeah some things I'm not quite so good at but um <laughs> <laughs> I love learning new techniques and actually um, I, I did art I did an art GCSE when I was um, doing my A-levels. I didn't have enough room to do art at GCSE when I was at school because I wanted to do the sciences and knew I wanted a career in science. So that kind of was more important, but I always enjoyed art. I did the art GCSE and really enjoyed it. And I carried on having art lessons throughout the, the 90s. And that was something else that kind of went on a back burner for a long time. And when I was at my worst physically, um, when when you're physically disabled and you've lost a lot of things in your life because of it and I, I went through so many losses you do end up suffering with depression and anxiety and I realized I hadn't left the house myself in four years by myself and I found out that Sure Trust were running these artworks programs in my local area so one day a week I would get on my scooter go down the end of the road and we would learn different art techniques that you probably wouldn't have done otherwise but that was great I learned so many new skills but also it got me back out of the house again by myself meeting with people because I just became frightened of people I was frightened of getting hurt I was frightened of getting stranded somewhere not being able to get home so all this fear just started to go and I was actually involved with 
so many different things. I was doing work, um, voluntary work with them in schools, in a school for children with disabilities. We did a kind of three month project all around Chinese New Year. So it got me doing all of these things and made me realize actually I still have something to give. And I carried on doing that for four years and I learned so many new things. And that was the start of me kind of just reteaching myself to do the knitting and crochet stuff but also just having the confidence to get a canvas and some paints and just have a go at doing some art again and I've always enjoyed looking at other people's astronomy sketches and I decided to bring those two passions together and sometimes when you do astrophotography you can get so obsessed with getting a good picture that you don't actually look at the object and the whole point of astronomy is to observe and I hadn't looked in a telescope eyepiece for a year so I make myself occasionally now leave my camera inside and I take my sketch pad outside and I just start drawing what I'm seeing and that evolved into drawing from photographs and actually the canvas behind me is a canvas print of one of my pastel sketches of the moon um, wow. was a surprise. <laughs> I, I used the, for, the Liverpool telescope the Liverpool two meter telescope to take a photograph of this crater trio and I made a sketch from the photograph and it won a competition last January so I actually won this canvas printed which seeing it that big made me think right my sketches need to get bigger as well because you can just capture so much detail when you draw big so I now do pastels quite often on black paper so I sometimes draw at the eyepiece sometimes from sketches sometimes just basic pen and paper so I kind of do a lot of the astronomy sketching but as well as that I've branched out into jewelry making I, I make things like I'm wearing a pendant here that looks like the eye of Sauron I hand paint these glass pendants to look like eyes um, oh gosh I'm trying to think of all the different things I make I've just started doing acrylic pouring um, which is really therapeutic you never quite know what result you're going to get which for someone that's a control freak is actually quite liberating because when you do an astronomy sketch you're trying to recreate something exactly every little pen stroke has to be perfect you do acrylic pouring you dump the paint on and spin it around you've no idea what's going to come out so it's quite exciting and quite liberating to do I also um I make stuff out, I like to make things from recycled things. So I recycle guitar strings and bass strings and turn those into jewelry. Old clothes I turn into lavender bags using lavender from the garden. I'm trying to make sort of sustainable gifts. So I was this year, everybody I know pretty much got a crocheted face cloth. <laughs> so to try and encourage people to stop using disposable cleansing wipes and using these crocheted cotton face scrubbies and face cloths. So yeah, all of those things are things that I can do in various levels of resting. So the crochet stuff, I can do lead down. Some knitting I can do propped up. A little bit of the painting I can do propped up. There's just whatever mood I'm in, I've got many different things on the go. <laughs> and just last week, actually, because I, I love biology still and I love microscopy. I have two microscopes and I was obsessed with finding tardigrades in the garden because from an astrobiology point of view tardigrades are really important because they're such extremophiles they can live out in the vacuum of space in stasis and then they come back to earth and rehydrate and come back to life again and i just thought i need a crocheted tardigrade so last weekend i just crocheted myself a tardigrade which you know, is uh, really cool so just i try to bring all my different interest together into one place so the music stuff comes with the guitar string jewelry the astronomy stuff with the sketching the biology with the crochet just always cross-linking and try and think of new things to do that are slightly different so yeah my uh, there are so many half done projects all over my house um I do a lot of card making and painting and you know the house is a tip you know there's stuff everywhere but <laughs> <laughs> if we get visitors it all has to get shoved in a cupboard out of the way <laughs> <laughs> so Mary, are there are there any other things that uh, we've not yet touched upon because you know uh, talking about these rabbit holes i have the impression when i talk to you uh, much longer there will be another at least five areas to pop up which i haven't yet known about <laughs> i love baking um i really enjoy baking and 
I think I learn a lot of baking from YouTube because I find baking from a cookery book really difficult. It's just some people are visual learners and I think I'm one of them. And ever since I discovered baking channels on YouTube, it's one of the, I, I spend far too many hours a day on YouTube watching random assortment of stuff for all my different interests. But finding baking channels is just amazing because you get these great ideas, ways of presenting things. And I, I just, I'd, I'd done kind of fairy cakes and biscuits and stuff but I'd never really pushed myself to try proper things so I made our wedding cake when we got married for four years ago it'll be in October I actually made a, a astronomy themed wedding cake and I'd never done anything like that before and I just thought I'm just going to have a go why not <laughs> and I realized why it's worth paying a hundred pounds to get someone to make you a cake because it's really hard work and it's really heavy and but it was great because I made it and you know I will always have the fact that I made it I made my own wedding dress as well mostly um I, I really like sewing I'm not very good at it but I like sewing as well so sewing and baking are kind of two other things that I dabble in that I'm certainly not an expert in but <laughs> So from uh, from what you say, I would say one of uh, you know the the main suggestions to people would be to uh, try things and uh, to do what what you love, whether you're good at it or not, and whether you're perfect at it or not. Just do it and uh, put yourself out there. Would you? Agree? Yeah, I mean, just practice yourself, and, and you feel like an idiot when um, I know when I was kind of getting ready to perform with the band. Mm -hmm. I will have everything set up at home and I'm, I, I practice smiling to the audience and <laughs> clapping the bits where I'm not playing to get the audience. Because if you do that for the first time at the gig, you're going to feel awkward and a bit weird. And I felt like a complete idiot stood in the dining room by myself going, come on, clap your hands. And you, you just kind of, but when you do it at the gig, it just feels natural to you. So practice baking practice making buttercream and piping it and if it looks terrible nobody ever needs to see it it's fine <laughs> just use that time by yourself to practice and perfect it and I never ever do a talk without practicing it first to an empty mm -hmm. room I feel really awkward practicing it just to my husband but he's a great sounding board because he, he's so intelligent and he knows where my strengths are and he has really good suggestions but for a first time through I practice my talk with all the jokes any funny things like that completely alien on my own in an empty room mm -hmm. and that makes it feel more comfortable when you do it for real and and I think that that's important that you feel comfortable doing it it's good to push yourself outside your comfort zone but not to the point where you want to be sick which is what I was doing when I first started doing gigs and I now know how not to put myself quite that much terror <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I think just find different ways of learning as well if there's something you like but you're struggling to learn it from a textbook it's like even physics, physics from a textbook can be daunting, but you watch Richard Feynman lectures on YouTube and it all clicks into place. He had such a good way of explaining things and having a good teacher on YouTube is just as good as going to an actual lecture and you will learn it better than if you're just reading it from a book, if that's the way you prefer to learn. And I think there is nothing that isn't on YouTube nowadays that you want to learn about. I mean, it's just... It's why if I can't sleep, I end up finding out about the mating habits of a native African rhino because you just don't know where you're going to go when you end up on the YouTube suggested thing. <laughs> but um, YouTube's great because I, I just find visual learning better than looking at stuff that's written down in front of me. Mm. So I think, yeah, just anybody that's interested in anything in life, whatever it is, just push yourself and just try and find different ways of learning it if you're finding it difficult. And just follow your heart. Don't let anyone tell you you can't do something because you're a girl, because that's just rubbish. Just if you've got it in here, whether it be baking, cooking, makeup, physics, astronomy, if, if it's in your heart, then follow it as a career, because you'll never have a day at work if you're doing what your passion is. I think that's just a wonderful piece of advice. Um, I would like to, to move on to asking you like the, the 
standard questions for, for Mutmacherei. Uh, the first one being, um, what do you need courage for? And uh, I guess you've already given us uh, some examples where you needed courage, like, uh, you know, playing with a band and uh, going on a stage for the first time. But, you know, when I just confront you with this question, what would be like your, your general answer? What, uh, what else do you need courage for? For me personally, um, I think I, I used to be a very confident teenager and I used to dance, I used to perform in dance shows and stuff, that was all fine. But the minute I kind of had a disability and lost my career and all those other things, it really hits your self-esteem. And I ended up suffering with horrendous anxiety and anxiety attacks. And I had no confidence in anything. And this is something I, I do, it might be a surprise to people because when I speak in public, I might come across as being very confident, but actually I'm quite shy and I don't have a great deal of self-esteem. And I still don't think anything that I do is good enough. And I, I have to really push quite hard to find the confidence to do any of this stuff. But five years ago, I was scared to even go to the village shop unattended because my anxiety was so bad. So I think I'm not quite sure how I got from there to doing public speaking and live web streaming, but it happened somewhere. <laughs> but I still feel the nerves before absolutely every single thing that I do. And I, I do still feel nervous about everything every time I submit an article I think oh they're going to send it back and think it's rubbish every time I write a new talk oh is it good enough is has it got enough information in it is it too long is it too short you know the usual kind of self-doubt so for me I need courage for everything that I do to kind of put yourself out there particularly in the internet age I think because people will dive on you so quickly if they don't agree with something or you get one tiny thing wrong I think you'll find that and the keyboard warriors are often at you so I think you've got to learn to have a thick skin if you are going to put anything out on YouTube um, I know I have a YouTube based channel I know that I'm not the best, best play, bass player in the world. I can't even say best bass player, let alone be it. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm completely expecting people to just stamp on me and say, well, that was rubbish. No one has, but I'm mentally prepared that it will happen one time. I, I know it will. And just be okay with that because... Mm -hmm. People are more likely to say something negative than something positive. So having no comments is definitely a positive sign. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess just by what you've just said, you know, that someone with all your talent and everything you do uh, needs courage for nearly everything will be encouraging to, to a lot of people because we, we don't expect it. You know? we, we think people who can do a lot of things, they are sort of confident by nature and uh, it, it's it's sort of given to them um, so when you need courage for nearly everything what gives you the courage that uh, allows you to do things oh that's a tough one I think actually meeting my husband was a big turning point because I mean, he met me when I was at my most disabled when I was at my most infirm and he was able to see past that and saw that me was still hiding in there somewhere and he really gave me the confidence he was he was a kind of mental health support worker he was an emotional support dog he was a physical carer helping me shower he was all of the things but without passing judgment and so open and so warm and so encouraging and when I did my very first talk it was to our history society and our village and I used to public speak all the time in my job I was petrified and he sat in the audience in the front row and every time I looked at him he was smiling and you're doing well keep going keep going and that was like oh good and for the first few talks I had to have him there because I'm like well, I can't do it unless he's there and you know once I start get repeat bookings and people want you to come back again that kind of makes you think okay I did something right I can do this and now I have an internal dialogue I do some mindfulness breathing before each thing to just ground myself because the anxiety can make you shallow breathe without you realizing it and you can get up and suddenly feel really dizzy so I make myself do the mindfulness breathing just kind of you know and if I'm feeling 
if I'm out and about, because my husband will tell you, I have got no sense of direction. I get lost going out to the car, honestly. It's, and the number of times I lose my car or I'm just lost somewhere and I'll be in a complete flap in tears. I phone him and within 30 seconds, he's grounded me again. And I think I just know that if I'm spiraling anywhere, any time, day or night, I will call him and I'll be okay. And just knowing that he's there, I don't even need to call him. So I think, you know, he has just been amazing. Just he has been the driving force behind everything that I do. And I, I know that I wouldn't have done any of this if I hadn't met him. So um, I'm so grateful that I, I was lucky enough to meet somebody and get married a second time round and actually find my soulmate who makes me do better than I ever thought I could. And he every day encourages me to do more. So I think having that, it doesn't have to be a husband. It can be a friend. It could be a parent. You know, my mum has always been amazing as well. I have to say she's always so encouraging and so proud. And my parents are really great. They, they love all the things I do. But Mark is the one that's there day to day when I'm having a wobble and think, oh, no, today I'm just not feeling OK to even leave the house by myself. And he'll think, no, you're OK. You can do this. So it's been amazing. Oh, Mary, that's uh, that's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. And you know what really touches me now is uh, how how incredibly much of this, you know, this courage that uh, that you sort of receive uh, from from your husband, you pass on to the world. Yeah? Because to me, you're such an inspiration. I could easily imagine that this is the case for for so many people. Yeah? With everything you do, and with every with the, uh, you know, the the positivity that you have, and uh, this attitude of always, you know, just do it and uh, just put yourself out there. It's uh, it's it's incredibly inspiring. So. You. Well, I think I've learned as well, if you do get something wrong, it's not the end of the world. They used to have this fear that, oh, if I play one note wrong in the song, everyone in the audience will point and laugh at you. No one even hears the bass. It, <laughs> they, they, they do. They're dancing to it. They just don't realize it. Most people do not really know what a bass player is doing. So it's great being in the background and just having fun because it doesn't matter if you get it wrong. If you stumble over a few words in a talk, just take a moment, pause, just get your teeth back in and just keep going. Nobody's going to hold it against you because 90% of the audience couldn't get up and do it. No. So I think it, it's it's okay to get it wrong. If you do a talk and it isn't perfect, it's still okay. There's been many times I've done talks that weren't perfect because I've been too sore or too tired. I still get a repeat booking from these people. So it's okay. It's, it's okay to not get it 100% right every time. And, you know, that that's important for people to understand as well. It doesn't have to be, if you see stuff on telly, it's all been edited together and it looks flawless and it, it, life isn't like that. You stumble over your words, you, you yawn, you hiccup, you, you cough, you need to have a drink of water, whatever. It's fine. Just keep going. Smile through it and keep going. Yeah, and my experience is that people actually love it because it, it makes you more human and more sort of uh, tangible and, and, and relatable. Yeah? And uh, I've often experienced that, for instance, when I forgot what I wanted to say. Yeah? And, uh, where, where was I? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was so happy to, to you know, help you out and uh, say, well, this is the last sentence you said. Or uh, you know, when I crack a joke about these things, they, they are grateful for an opportunity to to laugh so i guess yeah it's, it's definitely a good thing it makes you human like you say and i think exactly. my husband always says one of the things people like about me as a speaker is that i'm approachable mm -hmm. because you know i'll just go and sit in the audience and chat to people i'm i'm not the speaker and i'm going to sit over here by myself i i i love astronomy i love astronomers i want to hear what people are doing where their interests are i just talk to anybody and it's you know, it's really i don't think people always have that experience with the speaker and i I find that weird. I'm 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 just somebody that's there to give a talk, but I'm still a friendly, approachable person. And people email me afterwards for advice. I always help. You know, people know that they can do that. Anybody that's ever been to one of my talks or a practical session, they know that they can always contact me afterwards. I'm not somebody that puts themselves out there and then hides behind an email address that never gets answered. I actually always reply and help if I can. If I can't, I'll put them on someone else who can. 
and I, I find it amazing that not everybody does that I really I find it extraordinary <laughs> Well, so it's even better to have role models like you are uh, who put this out into the world and show others that this is a way to do it and that, that it's a much nicer and better way to do it. Yeah, so. I, I really hate prima donnaism. I just can't, I don't, I don't like arrogance as a trait. I find arrogance is one of the things I dislike the most in people. So I, I just hope I never, ever develop any signs of that because I, I really find it a horrible trait and that's just not something I hope I will ever have but I can't imagine it will ever happen <laughs> <laughs> well even everyone tries to put me on a pedestal and says you're so good at everything I just say ask my husband how often I got lost last year and he'll tell you I'm not good at everything <laughs> I can find my way around the night sky but I can't find my way around on terrestrial earth at all so <laughs> <laughs> have, have you ever had, had to ask the police for help to find your car? Nearly. Um, I was on a multi-storey car park that had just two levels and there's only space for about 50 cars on each level. 20 minutes I walked around in circles on that top level and I couldn't find my car. And you know, by this time my back was gone. I had a trolley full of heavy shopping and I was like, someone's stolen my car. I'm going to have to call the police. And I remember I've got a metallic gold 20 year old Rover. Nobody is going to have stolen it out of all of the cars on that car park. And if they did, they'd bring it back within a week because there are so many <laughs> things that are wrong with it that they would be kind of like oh my goodness how can you drive this so <laughs> but my husband said he's going to put a tracker on my phone so he can watch me walk around in circles for fun <laughs> <laughs> well anyway mary it was such a pleasure to to talk to you so thank you very much for being my guest today it was an incredible inspiration uh, i guess not only for me but most probably for a lot of people so um all the best to you i'm sure we'll stay in touch and uh, talk soon and uh, thank you so much thank you. Oh, thank you for having me and say so if anyone does want to contact me about any of the issues that we've talked about then you know my contact details will be in the notes Definitely, all your information will be in, in, in the show notes. Okay. So. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, Mary. Thank you.